2006, I was in Chicago for my very first healthcare business women's association meeting, the annual conference. It's the biggest event of the year besides the woman of the year. And I was all excited to go. I was the national sales director for my team. I had a pretty big team, about a team of 1,000. I got the job a few, minutes, a few months earlier. And what I noticed is what you all notice. From a rep perspective, my team was 53% female. But as it went up the corporate ladder, it became more male, it became whiter. And as a father of two daughters who made a commitment to my daughters when they were born, it started off personally, this journey to advocate for female leadership, is I wanted to create a better world for them. It was my commitment when I helped them for the very first time. And so as a leader, I also wanted to create better opportunities for my female leaders, because I knew it was smart for business, something that you all know. And so when I got to Chicago, again, all excited, I got into the elevator up to the floor to get my badge, and I came out of the elevator, and all that excitement turned to anxiety. I looked around, I looked all around, and I didn't see a single guy on the floor. <laughs> this is something that you experienced in another way. And I started to think in my own head, because that's where we make up our most wonderful stories, what am I doing here? This was a mistake. I'm crashing their party. I don't belong here. They're all looking at me. Truth be told, no one was looking at me, but I thought everyone was. So I stood in line to get my credentials, my badge, and that line moved at a glacial pace. And I thought, why can't this line move faster? I really just wanted to go somewhere quiet in the hotel and just hide, because I didn't think I belonged. So I got my badge, I got my credentials, and I did just that. I went to a quiet spot in the hotel, and I pretended I had big national sales director stuff to do. <laughs> I had my blazer on, because that's what they tell you to do. Wear your blue blazer. And back then, we didn't have smartphones, but we had Blackberries. And so I pretended I was on my Blackberry on a teleconference, but the truth is, I was playing Brick Breaker. And it was time for the general session to start. So 700, 900 women go into this massive general session, much like this. And I purposely decided to go in when the lights went down so I could sneak in the back to a table in the back, because I didn't want to be seen. I really didn't want to be heard. And when it came time for the breakouts, I was like, there's no way I'm going to those, because all the lights were on. Certainly, I'd be seen and heard. And I would get the question that I had already gotten multiple times since I've been there, like, why are you here? <laughs> now, the question really was, why are you here? But I heard it completely differently. I heard it with judgment, because I was too busy sort of worrying about why I was there. So I played the whole meeting small. I didn't take advantage of it. When I got to O'Hare to fly back to Newark, I beat myself up pretty fiercely on that flight back, because I didn't take advantage of the opportunity. I didn't serve my female colleagues back at my shop. I certainly didn't honor my commitment to my daughters. And I wondered, like, why did I show up the way I showed up? I had a big title. I had my blazer on. And then I realized, and we didn't have this word back in 2006, but I was the only in the room. And normally, as you can see, I'm usually not in the minority. And that was a big moment for me to understand where we are as far as working with each other. And I started thinking about all the other women, all the other marginalized groups back at the shop that are always the only in the room, much like all of you. And that changed my perspective on how I look at things. So today, I'm honored to be the only, or there's two of us in the room. <laughs> with you because all the things that you shared, we need your voice in healthcare. It needs to be louder. We need your wisdom. We need your drive. We need your voice because you all serve as the chief medical officer for your homes. And we need your energy because energy moves things. And to be quite honest, as healthcare goes, we've been successful but it's been dominated by white male energy for far too long. In order to solve tomorrow's problems, we need 
a mixture of energy, a mixture of perspectives. So today, I'm just thrilled to be with you all. And the conversation that you had today around stress and all that jazz, I have a story to share with you that you might be interested in. So I first found the HBA back in 2001. I went to my first WODI. If you've ever been, if you've ever been to New York, it's a beautiful event. I sat there and watched one of my mentors get awarded the Mentor of the Year, and I was inspired and motivated. And I made a commitment that I was going to join, but then something happened three months later. I was in the middle of New Mexico for a company offsite, and I was on a stretcher. And as they put me on the stretcher to put me in the medevac to tape me to Albuquerque, the only trauma one center in the state, I promised myself if I lived, I would stop chasing happiness. I was starting a change management project without any advance warning. There was no memo. There was no town hall. What happened on that last bad day is that Ford Explorer crossed the center line of the road, traveling 40 miles an hour, fully in my lane, hit me head on while I was riding my bicycle. I thought I was the smartest one at the meeting. Now, if your company decides to go to New Mexico in July, be very worried. <laughs> and be grateful, because they got a really good deal in the hotel. <laughs> but back then, and I've been an avid cyclist my whole life, I knew that cycling would be the new golf. So it was one of those off-sites back in the day. Back in 2001, you arrive on Monday. You depart on Friday. In between, they try to torture you with PowerPoint. And then on Thursday, you could go shopping or the spa or go golfing. I decided to bring my bike. To ride my bike in New Mexico, cross that off the states I've ridden my bike, I would be the smug one in the meeting. I would avoid the hotel gym. I'd get a few miles in in the morning, sort of live the New Mexican fresh air, and sort of rub it into my guy friends. What are you doing? You, know? you stay at the bar. I got up early. I rode my bike. And I had a great plan. And for the longest time, I thought my plan was working. You guys all just talked about the script that you all have, like to do it this way. Well, that script I was following through high school, through college, my early career. Do this, not that. Take this path, not that one. The script that we all get as boys on what it means to be a man, to be a provider, as a provider, you have to have all the answers. At least that's what I thought. As a leader, you have to have all the answers. At least that's what I thought. And I was following that script perfectly. But privately, what I was doing was pouring a whole bunch of stress inside. I thought I had to do more to be more. I thought I had to do extraordinary things to be considered extraordinary. I was never really satisfied fully. And this is something that both genders go through. We just don't talk about it much as men. But we deal with it, too. Over the weekend, I happened to watch the Taylor Swift documentary. I'm a big, we're big Taylor Swift fans in our house. <laughs> so I was here at the hotel, and I watched Taylor's documentary. And sh here she is, probably one of the biggest singers of all time. And she deals with this, believing that she had to beat her last record to be of value. So I spent all this time sort of chasing happiness. And you might know people about that do this today. I'll be happy when. So my chasing happiness was, I'll be happy when I get promoted. I'll be happy when I get that raise. I'll be happy when my girls go to that right college, whatever that right college happens to be. I'll be happy when this meeting is over. Not this meeting, the meeting I was at. Because <laughs> this meeting is a lot of fun. So I played that script. And there's an old saying, whatever you resist persists. So when you try to pack in the stress, it builds up, it builds up, and it builds up. And truth be told, if I look back in hindsight, I probably missed a whole bunch of warning signs because I was so busy on my hamster wheel doing, or the merry-go-round, if you will. There's an old guy that I used to learn sales from through cassette tapes in my car. 
most of you are young enough not to know this time where you listen to cassette tapes in the car. <laughs> but there was a guy named Zig Ziglar. And I would listen to his cassette tapes as a new pharmaceutical rep. I would put his tapes in the Ford Taurus I had, which is a really hot car. <laughs> and he would talk about living a do, have, be life. And I think I was living that life back in 2001, and I know a whole bunch of people are living it today. It's the do, hustle and grind, go 24-7. It's no longer 9 to 5. It's more like 9 to 9 or 9 to 11, or 7 to 11, or whatever it may be for you. So we can have all that stuff, the right labels, the right education, the right office. And then once we have all that stuff, we believe, this is the false promise, that we will then be happy, or we'll consider ourselves being successful, or being a leader. And you stay on this hamster wheel, and merry-go-round, and you never seemed to find a way to get off of it until I had my accident. Now, I remember every minute of the 19 minutes that took me from the accident scene to the trauma center in Albuquerque. I remember meeting my orthopedic surgeon, and then I met my anesthesiologist, and then I don't remember anything for four days. <laughs> he was that good. <laughs> During the ICU, I was in a, basically a drug-induced haze. I was strapped down. I was agitated. I was angry. That energy was coming out, and I didn't even know how angry I was. When my wife came, because at the time, my oldest was three and a half years old, and my youngest was seven months old, they called her and said, hey, you got to come out. And, they, and she asked, well, how long should I pack for? They're like, we don't know maybe a week or two. So when she got to the ICU, she started learning about my accident. The doctors told her, had Michael been 10 years older or not in shape, certainly he would have passed away before he got to the hospital. At the time, though, in the ICU, to add some levity to this whole story, I told her to go buy Amazon stock. <laughs> Back then, as a leader, I was highly directive. She did not listen to me. If you know anything about Amazon, back then, the stock was going for $15 a share. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't buy any. My story has a lot of forgiveness. I forgave her for that. You let her go on flying too. Yes, absolutely. So, but I also interviewed her for a job on our sales force. I went through, and this is disturbing, I went through the whole 45-minute interview guide, and she answered every single question. But I didn't hire her and she has forgiven me. <laughs> but when I came out of the ICU, the doctors told me about my injuries, the accident. The driver had a revoked license. He had five DUIs on his record. He should not have been driving that day. They told me the extent of my injuries, which in many ways I broke almost everything from my head all the way down to my toes. The injury that made it a life and death situation, where I knew from the EMTs the energy that they were putting out I knew my life was in question. That's why I made that bargain. If you live, you'll stop chasing happiness. Of course, during that time, I also asked them, how's my bike? It's a question only another cyclist can <laughs> really appreciate. They looked at me puzzled, and they started checking me for a traumatic brain injury. <laughs> and certainly, I had a major concussion because I went through the windshield. But the injury that was most significant is that my left femur shattered, and when the left femur shattered, it lacerated the femoral artery. So they started telling me about my injuries. They were like, Michael, you have to brace yourself. You're going to have a lifetime of dependency. You're going to lose your independence. There'll be more pain and suffering. So the world I knew, being somewhat of a stress puppy, but trying to be all calm on the outside, that was being flipped upside down and shaken violently. I made this commitment that I wanted to be happy, right? I lived. But the only emotions I really felt were anger, bitterness. I was revengeful. I grew up believing an eye for an eye. You harm me, I will harm you. So when I couldn't sleep in the hospital, because no one can sleep in a hospital, I thought of all these schemes to get back at the driver. So they were doing their duty. They wanted to set expectations pretty low because they thought, 
There's no way you're going to get back on the bike. You're probably not going to walk very well again. You're going to have a ton of surgeries for the rest of your life. And so this identity of being the leader, having all the answers, or playing Superman at home, because that was the dad and the husband and the provider, and being an athlete, that was all I knew. That was the script I was following. So I stayed in this funk for a long time. And eventually, I had a low moment, and a mentor called. And he listened to me vent, and I vented for a while. Because I only would really, truly open up and be vulnerable. Because we didn't know Brene Brown back then. There was no TEDx. There was actually no iPod, believe it or not. I wasn't in tune with vulnerability and courage. But he ultimately shared with me, he said, hey, Michael, all the events in your life are neutral until you label them. And at first, I was like, what are you talking about? Is this some Jedi mind trick that you're doing? <laughs> all of the events in your life are neutral until you label them? He said, like, you got to have it hold some space. Because right now, you're labeling your accident as you as a victim. And the thing is, everyone around me sort of validated that. They're like, poor you. And I'd be like, yeah, poor me. Life's unfair. Yeah, it is. But he went on to say, to say, hey, Michael, nothing has meaning until you give it meaning. That's part of your choice, that moment between trigger and label and trigger and meaning. But when that space gets a little bit longer, you can see different things, sort of in the spirit that we go where our eyes go. In cycling, the best way to get around the turn is to point your head around the turn. As you're driving home tonight or coming to the meeting tomorrow, even as you're driving your car, you sort of look around the turn to make sure the car goes that way. So he went on to share to say, hey, if you're going to look at all the reasons and all the things that you can't do and you don't have anymore, guess what? You're going to find more of that. But you can shift your perspective. You can give this whole event a different meaning. You can look at it as an opportunity not to play the victim, but as corny as the sound to play the victor. So I started thinking about that. I fought him a little bit, because that's what you do when you're in a funk. Sometimes the lessons that are given to you, you're not ready to accept them. But in the hospital, again, you have a lot of time. So I spent a lot of time thinking about it. And I started to think, being in healthcare, an industry that gives the gift of health. And at that moment in time, I had taken my health for granted. And I would have traded almost anything to have it back faster, except my wife and my girls. And I started thinking about it, this. Like, if we can worry ourselves sick, and gosh, do we worry ourselves sick? More so current day, because there's so much more coming at us, then maybe we can think ourselves well. Maybe there's a different way of going about life. Maybe there's a different script so we can point our eyes in a different direction. And something within me, I don't know what, told me just to breathe. And what I loved about the presentation today, especially after lunch, was just how connected the whole program is about breathing. It's something we lose sight of. It's the first thing we have when we come into this world. It's the last thing we leave with. And I didn't know anything about mindfulness or meditation. To be honest, coming from the East Coast where I grew up, I thought that's what crazy Californians did. <laughs> or people who ate grape nuts. Because only people who eat grape nuts meditate and vice versa. I was a wheat checks kind of guy. We didn't meditate. So the very next day after I had the big aha, when I realized I had more say in how I looked at my situation. I got out of my hospital bed into my wheelchair, and I wheeled myself to a quiet place in the hospital, which there are not many. And I just sat there and became quiet. And the thing is, when you first start a meditation practice or mindfulness, and I didn't know what to do, but when you first get quiet with yourself, you hear everything in your head. And then you're like, oh, this meditation stuff is too hard. I don't want this. I want the noise. But I stayed with that feeling of being uncomfortable. And I just started thinking about my intentions. How did I want to show up? Because every day, we get that choice to decide our intentions, our intentionality of how we want to show up, not only for ourselves, but everyone else in our lives. 
And I knew this, that the old model, the old model that us white guys have built corporately, the power over, the hierarchy, the directiveness, that model, that script that I was living with from the beginning of time, I knew I couldn't live that script and get better. I had to change the model. I had to make a shift that it had to be a power with. Power with everyone around me because I couldn't recover on my own. I couldn't get back to any sense of normalcy or back on the bike. And I just really wanted to get back on the bike, as crazy as that sounds, because that was something that felt normal. But I also needed, I knew I needed a different framework. So the power with was, yes, about the people in my life, my medical team, my wife, my daughters, my friends, my colleagues, strangers. But it was also about working through a different model, more of a power with model. And I knew this, that I could label that day, July 11, 2001, completely differently than how I was labeling it. So I decided to label that as my last bad day. Now, when I go out and talk, people are like, oh, Michael, is this like unicorns and rainbows? Or like, you never have a bad moment and like Skittles 24 seven, which is a very delicious candy, by the way, if you like that. And so for me, that's not what this is about. It's about the day where you decide to choose a different script, your own script, and not the script the society's giving you. That you realize you have more choice in how you show up. And yes, you're gonna have bad moments. I've had bad moments since that big old moment. But I don't want to give the bad moment any more fuel than it deserves. Because I know you all have had experiences where that meeting on Friday, that was a bad moment meeting, ruined your weekend. Which then pulled your energy away from the things and the people who truly matter. Or that commute in that goes somewhat poorly that you really have no control over, ruins your first two meetings because you're still stuck with it. So it is about feeling all the emotions we get to feel, because I believe this, that when we open ourselves up to feel everything, we can do almost anything. But to realize that we're going to have bad moments, and we don't want them to be as intense as they were before, or last as long, so we can go back to what makes us full of goodness. To go back to our awesome sauce, as I like to say. So I have a framework I want to share with you. It's about care which is perfect for healthcare because, again, I think this is the greatest industry in the world. Because when we show up together, truly together and connected, we give the gift of health. And if you've ever been unhealthy, you want to trade anything for that. And that's what we get to do each and every day. How cool is that? So CARA stands for Connection, Agility, Resilience, and Energy Management, four topics that you all have spoken about already today. So connection starts with who's in your Peloton. So a Peloton, for those that don't know, or may know it just from Peloton spin bikes, and usually when I do this talk, they're like, oh, we thought we were going to get this Peloton spin bike guy. <laughs> and I'm sorry to disappoint. But a Peloton, if you don't know, is a group of cyclists in a bike race. Think the Tour de France. It's made up of different teams, but they're all on the same road. They're all going in the same direction. And what they need is trust and collaboration and communication to go down the road as fast and as safe as possible. It's the same thing we need in life. So I use who's in your Peloton as who's on your personal board of directors, which is something that you all will speak about tomorrow. I use it as a metaphor for tribes and networks and teams. When I was in the hospital, I looked around at my medical team because we were dealing with a major problem in my recovery, and I had doctors and healthcare professionals from all different departments, and I looked over to my wife, and I'm like, they're like my medical Peloton. We're all going in the same direction, hopefully. So now I use it as, like, who are you riding with? But to, because to prevent that bad moment from turning into a bad day, we need a strong Peloton. We need people in our camp. Because this thing called life and career, well, we can't do it by ourselves. So I think a great Peloton is diverse. And you can run the gamut from your personal relationships to your professional relationships. But some of the roles I think a great Peloton has in it is people in your life that can provide you clarity when you're stuck. They're going to ask you that question that's going to help you get unstuck, because we all get stuck. There'll be people who are there in a crisis, like I was during my last bad day 
moment. People who you expect to show up and do. People that you don't expect to show up but also do. And then there are people that you expect to show up but don't. And I had a friend from high school, one of my best friends. He was in this camp. I thought he was the member of my Peloton who would be there for me in a crisis. But he never showed up. And at first, I was really angry at him. And then I realized that he just plays a different role in my Peloton. Because not everyone can play the same role. When it's time to challenge me, he's the guy. To confront me, to get me out of my comfort zone, to move me ahead. We need people in our lives to do just that. And when we need some comfort, some chicken soup for the soul, if you will, we also need those people. And of course, when it's time to celebrate our little wins to our big wins, we need those people. So understanding who's in your Peloton gives you a sense of confidence that you can be agile, which I think is going to be the big currency going forward in the next decade. We know this. With technology, the pace of life and business is only going to get faster. And I think that's the only prediction that we're safe to make, because right now, the world's a little cray -cray. We don't even know what's going to happen next week. But we do know we need agility. We've talked about sleep earlier today. I think one of the things that we have a problem with is our inability to be agile. Because what we're doing is we might go to sleep with our phone, but we wake up with it. And I know, and I use it too when I travel, that your smartphone is your alarm clock. But current day, so many people use it as their alarm clock. And before they even get out of bed, you're checking email. You're checking social. Before you've been able to set your intentions on how you want to show up, how you want to be today. What do you want to do today to have more? When we check our email and our social right off the rip before we even get out of bed, it frames our day. We go where our eyes go. It gives us a sense of everything that we haven't done while other crazy people are emailing us at the middle of the night or everything that we have to do. We automatically feel behind. And we start chasing. We get on that hamster wheel before we even have our first cup of coffee. We never have a chance to just be. So one tip I want to give you all is before you start the email hamster wheel, spend five, 10 minutes each morning grab some water, and just set your intentions. For yourself, for others, how do you want to show up? And one technique I learned as the stress percolates, even after you set your intentions in the morning, because stress will happen because that's part of being in a career, being in a, in a dynamic environment, was grabbing a PBR, which does not stand for Pabst Blue Ribbon. <laughs> so I do not advocate that. Life's too short to drink bad beer. If that's your thing, that's your jam. But a, grabbing a PBR is a pause, breathe, and reflect. So when I was in my corporate world, one of the things that I got evaluated on was profit before royalty. So again, in the hospital, a little time to think, because I used to hate that little acronym, PBR. We used to talk about it all the time. And when I felt the stress coming on, because when we have more awareness in terms of how we're showing up, we can feel our stress being percolated up. We can feel it in certain parts of our body. We just grab a PBR, pause, breathe, reflect. And it's as simple as having one of those belly breathing exercises that you all did after lunch, or maybe just one or two minutes. It's perfect in between meetings, because let's be honest, we're going coast to coast with our meetings. The first 10 minutes and the last 10 minutes of every meeting are the worst 20 minutes of every meeting. Because the first 10 minutes, no one's arriving on time. You're still adjudicating the last meeting. And the last 10 minutes of each meeting, you're wondering, where do you have to go next? And so we go to our meetings, and we're still thinking about the last meeting. So grabbing a PBR gives us a chance to sort of slow our breath, slow our heart rate, our blood pressure, and be reflective, maybe shift our perspective on things, maybe see things from a different angle. And it may even be a chance to sort of check ourselves on the story that we're telling ourselves. 
Because we all don't have to believe everything we tell ourselves. I used to do this all the time when I had the worry and the stress and the anxiety, and I tried to be calm on the surface, but I didn't think I was enough. And I thought to be enough, I still had to do more. To be more, I had to chase happiness. But sometimes our own self-narrative is the thing that gets us most tripped up. It gets us in, in our way if we want to smash the glass ceiling or take that bold move or speak up in a meeting. So we have to stop listening to ourselves sometimes when we're not necessarily as kind to ourselves as we are to other people. And that brings us to resilience. If you're in this industry, you, by just the matter of being here, are resilient. Change happens. And there will be moments where you'll feel like an imposter, that you'll miss the mark. You don't want people to find out that you're a fake and a fraud. And when I went to the Healthcare Business Women's Association Conference in San Diego in November, one speaker got up and said, well, this never happens to guys. And I was like, oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> it just shows up a lot differently for us. We all go through moments where we doubt ourselves. And in these moments, that's when we have to tap into our grit and our tenacity and our resilience. Because when we can get back up again, then we can do more of our goodness again. So one way to build more resilience is, one, not surprising, to breathe. And in that breath, that moment of reflection, you can determine what you have control over and what you don't. As we're living with the coronavirus, there are things certainly that we have control over, and there's a whole bunch that we can't. As we try to walk this thin line between exercising caution and going into a full-on panic. But when we're jacked up and we have anxiety, there's no way with all that cortisol and adrenaline rushing through our bodies, we can make the type of connections and relate to each other like we need to in order to deliver the gift of health. So the first step is to breathe. The second step is to come up with your kick-ass list. Again, we beat ourselves up more frequently than we care to share in corporate workshops. Trying to bring our full selves to the job we don't want to talk about that. We believe that's too personal. I respectfully disagree with those people. I think we need to get to a point where we can talk about some of the things that we all deal with, men, women, leaders of color, different groups. So the kick-ass list is a list that you can just hold in private. I have my list. I bring it with me on every trip. I spend 10, 15 minutes. I did a few months ago. And I listed out all the times I kicked ass because we tend to blow past those. The brain is not necessarily that sticky. It doesn't remember our big wins. But boy, that moment in seventh grade, wow, we still remember that. So having a kick-ass list helps us just counterbalance when our inner critic or that self-narrative isn't that kind to us. Of course, our Peloton can help us through these moments. So if we need someone who can clarify things after we get stuck and we need to get back up, that's there. And then my big thing is looking for small wins. So as I was coming out of my recovery, one of the goals was to make one degree of progress each and every day. And that's how I measured. That was my KPI, how much flexion and extension I could get out of my legs. So I had a little bit of a mantra besides, hey, that's interesting, because I had that one too, was work hard today to make tomorrow better. So one degree today, one degree tomorrow, one degree of the next day, Pretty soon, after a week, I had seven degrees of flexion. I got closer to my ideal. So looking for those small wins, and looking for the wins in the ordinary. And then finally, gratitude. You talked about sleep earlier. I think one of the great practices you can do as you get ready for bed and having a bedtime routine is having a moment of gratitude. It's what we do in our house as we're brushing our snags, which we call our teeth. We think about the three things that we're grateful for during the course of the day. They can be small, they can be ordinary. They can even be moments of challenge because we know that our challenges tend to lend to our greatest growth. And it's a great way to capstone our day because we know this, and I know this from experience, when our head hits the pillow, all of work floods in, all the things that we haven't done. So having a moment of gratitude, just five minutes, you can journal it out or just talk it out, gives us a chance to remember that we did something pretty cool today. It might be small, it might be large, but it's something that is a building block for your success tomorrow. 
And it also allows us to start to feel more things. We have a lot of unconscious bias in the workplace. And as I shared with Deloitte at an HBA event in uh, Huntington Beach or the Costa Mesa actually a few days ago, I also think we have a lot of conscious bias. So all the workshops that we do about unconscious bias, I think they're great, but I think we need to also address conscious bias. That might be our biggest problem. But we also have a bias against emotion at work. We'll accept male emotions, being angry, being frustrated, all that, but dare a woman cry. All it is is a different emotion. And sometimes that emotion is anger. Sometimes it's sadness. But when we can accept all the different emotions that we can feel as human beings, then we can do almost anything. And here's the last thing I want to share with you. And this is about energy management. When we talk about work-life balance, at the core of it, what we talk about is feeling drained. We're out of energy. And so anything in alignment just works better. It's more effective. It's more efficient. And through my recovery and through my career, I discovered five key areas that help drive our energy. So we don't spend it all at work and then come home with our energy leftovers. Because I'm not sure about you, but I don't like cold pizza. <laughs> but so often, especially current day, we spend all of our energy at work, and we come home, and all we have are fumes. We make dinner, and then we're back to the couch doing email. And we don't have the energy for the people who matter most, or the things that matter most. And that's not to say that we should you know, not do work stuff to balance it out, it's making sure that we're mindful about how we spend our energy. So part of it is about spiritual and about having purpose. Am I part of something bigger than just me? And I believe all of you are based on your contributions to this industry because you're helping patients downstream, regardless of what job you have. The emotional part is how cluttered our mind is. Are we multitasking? Can we stay focused? Can we do deep work? Of course, so the relationship part of this is who's in our peloton and making sure that you're spending time with people who bring out the best in you. And if you don't have those people in your life, it may be time to drop them from a cycling perspective. Maybe they don't deserve to be in your peloton any longer, which is hard to do. From a wellness or a physical perspective, our health matters in terms of driving our energy. There is a book out there called... Um, Fitness after 40, and I'll give this to you because you all spoke about having your health. And there's an acronym called FACE. Well, I'll add an S to it for FACES. And it stands for flexibility, aerobic capacity. The C stands for carry some weight. The E is equilibrium, working on your balance. And the S I've added is for sleep. That you get to a certain age, if you happen to be over 40, it works if you're under 42. I happen to be over 40, so I work on this. But it's thinking about your health today. So when you retire and you hang up your cleats and you do that next big thing, you have the health to live that part of your life. And then finally, work, which you all talked about just a minute ago. Do you have a work environment that allows you to honor your values? Because if your values aren't honored at your place of employment, then it's probably draining your energy. And you always have choice in terms of where you work. Even when you feel somewhat stuck, there are always options. Or at least 97% of the time, not to paint in an absolute brush, as I just did. So the last question I have for you, well, actually, before I get to that, is all this helped me flip that script. That script that Ziegler gave me, the do have be became be do have. So now, when I set my intentions, and you all can do this starting tomorrow, I decide how I want to be today. And when you start your day and frame your day that way, then you start doing those things. So say you want to be happy, you do things happy people do, like kindness and laughter and empathy and holding the door open those happy moments, the ability to shift out of our bad moment a little bit faster so we can go on to some goodness to make that connection to be relatable. And then, as you do those things, you actually have more of it. 
So as you show up with the intentionality to be happy or be a leader or be successful, however you define it, and you do those things, in so many ways, you start to have more of it in your life. It's a flip of a lens from scarcity to abundance in a land where we market through scarcity, where we market through fear, where we broadcast the news through fear, through scarcity, that there's only so much to go around. And my mission here with HBA and the work I do and just the stuff I do in my personal, professional life is to make sure that we're building a bigger tent a bigger table so everyone who is competent has a seat. Everyone has a voice. Everyone can be heard and seen because we need everyone to solve tomorrow's problems. So yes, we've been successful, but we've left the last success on the table because previously we haven't heard everyone. We haven't seen everyone. And eventually, I was able to get back on the bike. So the reason why I'm here when Trisha and I talked, she was like, hey, can you come out? And I was like, well, I'm going to be out in Huntington Beach. So I was here all last week for a cycling camp. So we rode all around California. I would have to say California drivers are so much nicer than folks in New Jersey. And the weather's better. And I totally get why you love it out here. <laughs> my youngest daughter is out here for college. And so I'm going to bring my bike. And so for me, getting back on the bike was a bit of normalcy. It's a little bit of an external merit badge. But what I realized along the way is that, you know, in terms of where your eyes go, when you look at the internet and all the different tips and all that jazz as far as how to do something, the really cool thing about life in 2020 is that there are a lot of ways to do it. There's never one way. That was a script I had way back when, that there was one way. What's really cool now is that there's so many different ways. And so you seek counsel, you seek mentorship, you seek advice, and then find the way that works for you. But ultimately, it starts here in terms of where your eyes are headed. And hopefully, they're looking at what's within you. Because so often, we just sort of skim the surface on our growth and development. That's what our workshops are designed to do in corporate America. We can cross off it off our to-do list or check the box that we did a workshop. We have our personality assessment from DISC. We put it up on our door, but we don't dive deep enough. We don't look within. That requires us to do a deep dive. That requires a bit of emotional labor. But that's the thing that makes all this possible in terms of your growth. With more emotional labor, when looking within to start, it allows you to change that narrative that you have. It allows you to make a different type of connection, build a different peloton, and advance your career in the way that you want to advance your career. So the question I'll leave you, it's more rhetorical, is where are your eyes looking? Hopefully it's looking at a very positive future because we need you. As someone who lost his health but regained it, we need you. We need your voice, we need your wisdom, we need your energy to make things better, just a little bit more tomorrow than they are today. So there's something I put together sort of in celebration of International Women's Day. Now, I'm a big believer that I really want to get to a point where we don't have International Women's Day. Because every day is International Women's Day. And I'm also a big believer on these big days and Gay Pride Month in June, or any other day that we have in the catalog or calendar, it doesn't matter what we did yesterday. We all posted equal signs. It's all little, so, and myself included. It matters what we do today. It matters what we do tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. It should be a 365 type of thing because we should celebrate everyone. And if you meet any guys that happen to wonder, like, where is International Men's Day? It's November 19th, and it's a day to celebrate positive role models positive male role models in terms of bringing diversity and inclusion to the table. So you can let them know for any of those guys that think all this diversity and inclusion thing is a male lose thing, which it's not, that they have their day, but they have to earn that day by being a positive role model. So here's a workbook. It's some of the things that I talked about as far as worksheets on how to build your Peloton, little different tips on how to grab a PBR. It's all in that. You can download it. It's all free. And of course, there's not a slide presentation without a closing, like, hey, how to contact me. So, but thank you for having me. 
Thank you for your attention. I know this is a tough time slot at the end of the day because you're you know, hungry and got to commute and LA traffic's nuts. So thanks for being with me and I hope, um, hope you have a good rest of your conference. Thank you.